G'day YouTube, I'm back again after a short hiatus. I've been organising the Star Stuff Festival, uh, Star Stuff 2, and it was just an amazing event. The weather was perfect, uh, the stars were out in force two nights in a row, and I got to meet some amazing people. Of course, we had Jeff Notkin, who gave me this shirt, and we had uh, Fraser Kane and Amy Shira Tidal, and Dr. David Malin, and just so many people, it was incredible. Uh, and I walked away with this uh, wonderful next dome. I'll put I'll put another video up about the upgrade process because this is a sky shed pod base with a next dome roof, uh, and that was really to fix this zenith issue up here. So that, this uh, panel goes all the way back. Anyway, I'll do another video about that. But I did promise that I would put up my talk, and of course the talk is long. It's different from YouTube. You know, I can't. I can't edit out all the breaths and the pauses and the ums, so, but I did promise I'd put it up for you, so here it is, enjoy. Oh yeah, and something else I should probably mention is that it repeats a lot of the stuff that's been on my YouTube channel in the last year anyway. Um, but also, it was, caught, it was sort of filmed on a potato, uh, just a little webcam, and we switched over to a good camera halfway through. Uh, obviously, I was on stage, so I couldn't handle any of that stuff, but uh, hopefully it comes across okay anyway. All right, bye. I'm in the rather awkward position of being the first on stage right before my own talk, so rather than introduce myself, I'm going to walk off and play a short pre-recorded introduction that a friend of mine put together, and then uh, you guys will politely applaud as I come back on. <laughs> It's hard to know why Dylan O'Donnell is here today. No experience, no credentials, just a few photos of space that he won't stop talking about. I even had to mute him on Facebook to avoid his constant oversharing. We all did. But there is one reason he is here. One good reason why he can stand on stage and have his name on the t-shirt along with other more qualified human beings. And that one irrefutable reason is he's paying for this whole thing. <laughs> really? Is this guy serious? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dylan O'Donnell. <laughs> Last year we had uh, such a big program. Everyone in the program was like a PhD level scholar. Uh, it was, it, everyone was a doctor, uh, which made us all feel rather inadequate. Uh, we still have some doctors on the, on the list this year, um, but yeah, it seems like this year is the year of the autodidact, the self-taught, often self-funded people who still manage to contribute to the science. There are examples of a different path that we can take if we want to. A photographer friend of mine said to me recently, I like your photos because they are so scientific. And I reflexively wanted to say, well, no, not, not really. Uh, but he thinks of them as scientific because of the way I get them, the way I process them, the way I require them. But some astrophotographers use the term pretty pictures, mockingly to suggest how far removed they are from academia. And they're partly right sometimes. The first time I learned about Fraser Kane was after I had bought my first telescope and I joined his virtual star party. I shared a photo of the dense row over the Yucas region and sent it in to the broadcast and the host featured the photo live on air and said this was sent to us by astronomer Dylan O'Donnell. I nearly fell off my chair. He called me an astronomer. I only bought the telescope two weeks ago. How cool is that? I'd imagine if you could just buy a stethoscope and call yourself a doctor. <laughs> an amateur doctor. Uh, hands up, who has a telescope? Congratulations, you're all astronomers, just like that. <laughs> 
It's uh, the difference between amateur astronomers and amateur doctors is that uh, they make a lot more money than we do. <laughs> Alternative therapies. So I've been uh, busy since I uh, spoke to you well, this time last year. I attended the industry roundtable in Queensland for an inquiry into the Australian Space Capability and the South Australian Space Conference, and have been following the announcement of the Australian Space Agency, Agency with great interest. 20 jobs uh, announced, and uh, they've started advertising for them. I've always said I'd be happy to be like a janitor, if even at NASA, just so uh, parties. You could say, yeah, I work for NASA. <laughs> and, uh, it'd be a great way to be that woman. Um, <laughs> all the jobs so far, they appear to be like management related and really boring kind of pencil pusher government type jobs uh, in Canberra. The real logo was announced uh, about a week ago, when I announced it was just sort of added to a document. So it looks like the intern just wrote Australian Space Agency and put it on a circle background. But I found this other one, uh, in the one that says investing in Australia's future. That's done by a guy called Nick Mowbray, who just went ahead and just did it himself and uh, before, the, before the announcement was final. I love what he's done because he's sort of combined the uh, the old 80s NASA worm logo with the new wingtip logos and you can see the fusion of that in there. I like that people just went and go ahead and do things, I think that's fantastic. Now NASA and ASA, or as we say here, ASA, <laughs> will be uh, nothing alike but there's a strong military component to both and Trump has announced Space Force. There are some graphics floating around with like astronauts in camouflage and stuff, <laughs> this is super weird. Now, I don't know where ISIS is, but I know they're not in space. Um, we've seen government-sanctioned space forces before, though. We know what they look like. <laughs> I just hope they get better shot training than these guys. Uh, about six months ago, YouTube demonetized my channel because apparently my acoustic guitar and banjo covers of heavy metal songs weren't getting enough views. So they stopped paying me, which is weird because I'm a verified YouTube partner and I run a Google partner company. But I took it as a challenge and started pumping out astronomy videos and smashed their quotas by orders of magnitude, but they still won't pay me. But I still think you should check out my acoustic cover of Tool Schism, if you get a chance. That's quite good. Uh, also, in the last year, I was invited back to the West Australian uh, ESA facility to shoot photography at DSA-1. Uh, this is their deep space tracking station in tandem with Canberra that received the last few transmissions from Cassini as it plunged through Saturn's cloud tops earlier in the year. We also get the beautiful Gaia data through here, uh, Mars Express and lots of other space missions. They asked me about the shoot, and I asked them if I could fly a drone around their facility, as you do. I'd actually never flown a drone before, so I went out and bought one, and learned. And took, it took about five months to give me permission to fly the drone around their dish. In the meantime, I'd already crashed my drone into a tree uh, around, around the wetlands up here. Of course, I didn't tell Lisa that. <laughs> uh, they said yes, they gave me permission, and I secretly bought a new drone. Uh, they gave me a few rules, which basically boiled down to, please don't crash into our dish. Uh, so I spent three days and nights taking photos of the dish and flying the drone, and I finished the job. And on the last flight, I thought I'd take a selfie with me in the dish, and I crashed. <laughs> Thank God I didn't crash it into the dish uh, on their newly installed solar farm. After sending the logs to TJR, they confirmed it wasn't my fault, an engine, failed, an engine failed and they replaced it for free. But somehow I don't think they would have replaced DSA-1 for free had I crashed into it. Uh, so here's a short little clip of the shoot that I put together. That should be a video, Jazz.
just quickly, another couple of small acc accolades since last year, I've had a busy year, was Professor Brian Cox selected this image of mine broadcast during the stargazing ABC live record uh, <laughs> event. He was there, at the, he was breaking the record with us. Yeah, we smashed it. We absolutely smashed it. We, we set out the record ourselves a few years ago, so we smashed ourselves. But um, I also got the Queensland Combined Astronomical Society's Member of the Year Award for introducing uh, the science of astronomy and space to the area of Byron Bay and beyond. And I assume you know beyond means Queensland, because Byron Bay is in New South Wales. Um, now, my background is in IT and web, web applications, and the last startup uh, one I mentioned an online tool I developed that shows you every permutation of uh, uh, your narrowband images, so combining hydrogen, uh, sodium, uh, oxygen channels, and it shows you every uh, possible combination. This year I developed a simple product neutral astronomy calculator that lets you enter in your telescope, camera, IP specifications, as well as reduces, bellows, and you can simulate uh, what you'll see uh, in the eyepiece and the camera at the same time, which uh, I hadn't seen in anywhere else. It's extremely useful when you're buying new gear, particularly because you can test whether you're oversampling or undersampling. Uh, you can't just buy a, a, a telescope and a camera and just expect that they'll work together. You need to actually simulate these things and see that the uh, magnifying power works with the pixel size and things like that. Um, there are an, another couple of sites that do that, but this is the only one that I know that will do eyepieces cameras at the same time and show you the sampling magnification previews and all that at the same time. For the uh, Northern Hemisphere uh, folk, we've got uh, some comparisons of size down the bottom here. You see they, they win out because of Andromeda, but other than that, we've got all the best stuff down here. Um, now, I'll digress from the back-to-back -back astronomy stuff that I've been doing in the last years. Remember that I still have a family to look after. So uh, one big thing that happened this year was my oldest son, Zenon, started school. And there he is, uh, with an instructional video we put together about making explosive thermite. <laughs> <laughs> so we had the decision as parents to uh, pick a local school this year. Uh, those of you who were here last year might remember I mentioned that I've been unbaptized by the Catholic Church at my request. And I can tell you that doesn't look good on the application form for any kind of Catholic education. <laughs> uh, as good parents, we checked all the options of private and we checked the, the local Steiner school. I asked them whether science conflicted with their spiritual beliefs and went downhill from there. <laughs> they, they told me they literally believed in fairies. Uh, so the decision for us about public versus private education seemed to be an easy one. Uh, good on you, Byron Public School. Uh, here's to Australian public education. Not only are we really happy with the school, but Star Stuff and Jeff Knock and Averilite Meteorites have donated a half kilogram meteorite to the school, and their robotics program will be giving us a demonstration in the vendors area at 3 o'clock tomorrow. See, this story eventually got back to astronomy, so thanks for sticking with me through that. Uh, Something else I got to do last year was fly to LA and actually visit the Celestron factory and meet the directors of the teams and the engineers uh, behind the stuff that I use every day. Uh, this was an amazing experience for me and I got to hear and feedback to the, de the engineers who actually developed the stuff. They're all amazing people and I got to see my second space shuttle and the Griffith Observatory. Um, for the gear heads, uh, these were unannounced at the time but there were some RASA 36s. Uh, on the floor, and then the F2 scopes, uh, basically a 14 inch uh, RASA F2, but they're calling them 36s, which means that they're actually migrating away from that imperial measurement system because the 36 stands for centimetres. So hopefully, one day we'll all be talking about our um, telescopes in terms of centimetres rather than inches. Um, in, the margins, <laughs> in the margins of this crazy year I've been having, I've been uh, getting out and taking photos when I can, and this is a uh, M45 using the RASA 11 inch, which is actually RASA 28 if we're talking metric. Uh, the diffraction spikes are an optical aberration, so they're not real. They, uh, they come from the cables hanging in front of the telescope. Now, I set out to make a pretty picture here, but does that mean that the image has no scientific value at all? The diffraction spikes on the stars are not only unreal, but they can be exaggerated for aesthetic reasons and people actually do this in Photoshop, which I think is really weird. Um, the reason I'm showing you this is because uh, two months after it was taken, I was doing an audit of my raw data. I'd get a cup of tea and pull up the unprocessed single exposures and blink them. Uh, blinking is the same process that, we used, that was used to discover Pluto, and so you just flash the uh, exposures in rapid succession and basically see if anything moved. Uh, and this should be playing, there you go. And you probably can't see that on this little... Uh... So I uh, found a star, a 
Moving. Okay. So it turned out to be asteroid 9199FOI FO1. I used Astrometrica software to ID this two months later. So you can do this well after the fact. You can go back through your old data. And, uh, and I actually ended up going back through like 12 months of exposures and uh, seeing if I could find anything else. And, and you can look up and I found it was discovered by a Japanese observatory in 1993 and I generated an, an MPC report, which is a text file you can send to the Minor Planet Center. I ended up finding a bunch more. Uh, this one, I, instead of just finding it in my data, I went out to find a known one and then uh, and, and I could find that this, this is one of the potentially hazardous ones, so it's big and bright and could, could swing by if it gets kicked off its orbit and uh, it has two moons, you could say. It's a planet like Pluto. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a, another image of a Leo triplet I took the other night and I found this little guy in there. So a lot of people um, uh, come up to me, you know, people who aren't astronomy people, they just go, oh, you're into astronomy, do you ever see UFOs? And I'm like, yeah, and I see them all the time. And then I turn them into IFOs because I identify what they are. <laughs> and, uh, and then I report on them. Uh, and this was discovered by Max Wolf in Germany and named after Verdi's Opera. This is what the reporting looks like uh, when you go to send the report to the Minor Planet Center. And uh, it generates all the uh, coordinates. They don't actually want to see the photos. They just interpret the data that you've got from the photos. You send them the text file, and after a while, they give you an observatory des designation, which I'm working on. It's a bit like a computer game. You'll send them something, and they'll say that's crap, and you'll send them something else, and they'll say that's good. They just do it twice or two or three times, and you work your way into getting an official um, designation, which I'm working on. Uh, you might be wondering why it's called the Minor Planet Center. Uh, it's basically a big database of minor planets, which are more commonly referred to as asteroids or comets. Uh, it's maintained by the International Astronomical Union, the same union that devoted Pluto to the dwarf planet in 2006. In that same boat, the same resolution, they decided not to call all the other stuff planets the dwarf planets. They called them minor planets. But now we're meant to call them solar system bodies. This is what the IAU tells us. So you can't, you can't use these other terms now. Uh, which is maybe ironic because I noticed that they registered the domain name Minor Planet Center in 2005 before the Pluto decision. So now they're stuck with the, this website called Minor Planet Center, even though it's not meant to be called that. Uh, I must admit to a certain shout and prattle about that. Uh, I should uh, mention that none of this is my day job. I'm still running a Google partner company, organizing star stuff, and because I'm a masochist, I go and enroll at Swinburne for postgraduate study. Which basically means I end up with a science degree in astronomy, given I've already done my master's in IT. It's all online and it's pretty lonely. I don't really have any friends or I don't watch television anymore. Uh, there's a lot of writing, but I thought if I just get to read and write about space, that's what I do anyway. So I might as well get a grade for it. Uh, I think by the time I finish, this equates to about 33,000 words, which is the length of a short novel. Uh, but the cool thing was that it forced me to go back to square one and properly, re properly relearn some concepts like RA and DEC. And so as a, thought, as a site project, I thought, I wonder if I could write the base code for a planetarium in a Google spreadsheet. And I know you're thinking spreadsheets are awesome. I'm so glad I bought a ticket to start stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I came up with this, which basically takes your GPS coordinates and uses the local time to calculate the celestial coordinates, the zenith, the zenith of W. I say basically, but it took me forever because I'm, I'm not a maths guy. Even though I wrote the Intel Astronomy Calculator, I love maths, but I'm not fluent mathematically. So, uh, I mean, in year, in year nine, I actually got zero on a maths test. <laughs> it, was a, it was a rough year. I was moving schools and I was catching up ever since. I got kicked out of that school within six months, uh, not for failing maths, it was because it was a Catholic school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I should mention that the Swinburne online course is not maths heavy. Uh, you do learn physics and you do learn a bit of maths throughout it, but it's not a prerequisite. Uh, you basically learn on the go, so I'm learning about Newton's laws and things like that. Instead of using the fancy equations though, I try and work things out from step A to B, just one step at a time. Uh, so I've just nut through one cell at, cell at a time in my spreadsheet, which is why I did this. None of this gets seen or graded by Swinburne, they just wanted the short answers. Uh, but I knew if I could work this out, I could do something cool. So I went back to the Minor Planet uh, Centre website because I was, I was interested in this list buried down in the menu system, the Near Earth Object Confirmation List. 
these are the things that have been discovered typically uh, within the last 24 hours. They're brand new and basically unknown to science before now. They're usually asteroids, sometimes comets, uh, but if alien if aliens invade, they show up on this list first. There's like little dots of light in the sky that are coming closer to us. Um, but it's not very arresting, is it? It's about as exciting as the spreadsheet I showed you just before. So I had a crack at making it a bit easier to read uh, because what I wanted to know was can I see any of this from my house? Uh, so I came up with this. Jazz, can you click on that link and just bring that up as a live? Or just go to firemayobservatory.com.au. Okay, so this list came, um, you know, it's live, so it comes every it comes every minute, and I process it every 15 minutes, and turn it into this uh, image here. We can see where we are as the big white line in Byron Bay, and other observers can put their GPS coordinates in and change that uh, to them. And we've got yellow there to show us where Bruce Willis is at any given time. <laughs> Deflect an asteroid. Um, so I developed this Earth's intrusion detection system, and I. I said I sent this to an observatory that I know about, a professional observatory. And they said, Dylan, we have like a PhD astronomer here who pauses over that list and spends three days trying to interpret it to see if we can actually see something. So they've started using this um, each night to to see if they can actually see some of this stuff. But you can see this this data has a bias in it. Um, this is how about no, it doesn't. The bias in the data is that it's this line, right? You'd think that if we were discovering stuff, we'd be discovering all over the place, or at least half of the globe in the celestial sphere because of night time at any given time. Uh, but we're really down to just a couple of observatories who are doing this uh, anymore. Uh, it's, there's, there's things that are going to be biased in the data anyway. We've got the ecliptic, which is where you'll find most of the stuff, um, except maybe a, a Moomua, the interstellar comet that came somewhere completely different. The survey domina dominating the list at the moment is the Pan-STARRS Network and the Catalina Sky Survey in Tucson, Arizona, uh, with professional wide field equipment that us astronomers really don't have the firepower to compete with. But this means that the discoveries are limited uh, to where they're in Arizona on any given night. So this list is sometimes very short, like this, and sometimes it's very long, depending on the time and budget allocation they have to define these things. Uh, not to mention the position of the Earth and the Sun. Obviously, there's a bunch of the stuff, stuff behind the Sun that we just can't see at any given time. Uh, estimates for how much we've discovered so far vary, but I've heard possibly about 90% uh, discovery for NEOs above one kilometre, um, which would be catastrophic um, if they hit us. But uh, we've discovered only about 10 to 15% of the smaller stuff, so the stuff less than a uh, kilometre. Uh, these estimates are made by... Uh, can you go back to the slide the keynote presentation yeah i thought uh, that these uh, these estimates are made by smart people so i assume that they know more than i do about this um, but here's an animation from the minor planet center showing us gas giants in blue and the kyber belt objects in red i don't know if that's playing there we go <laughs> so that's the animation and i thought i would uh stack the animation just as you would a um a star trail image, and I thought that was that was cool. <laughs> uh, now bear in, bear in mind, this doesn't show the stuff near. Uh, oh, let's go back one. That doesn't show stuff near Earth or the asteroid belt. This is all the Kuiper belt stuff. Example of stuff that we don't know um, is that most of this stuff in red we've only discovered since 1993. So the Kuiper Belt was something that was basically theoretical until that time. So we have these estimates about how much we know and how much we don't know and how much we don't know we don't know, but uh, really we don't know. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> hopefully it will work out. Of course the Oort cloud lies further out from this and that currently exists mostly in theory. The same way the Kuiper Belt existed mostly in theory. So we are going to get stuff flung from there towards the Earth. Um, this graph shows how much we've been discovering year by year and by survey. Now, it was in um, 1996 when Congress in the United States decided to fund the question of how risk are we at being wiped out by an asteroid. And you can see we've made great progress, uh, but we're discovering more and more every year. And the funding um, for formal, formal survey work is about to end in 2020. Uh, the Pan Stars is in pink and the Catalina is in green there. You can see they just dominate everything. Um, but where are they? 
that's, that's where the observations for that list are coming from. And you can see why the data is so biased, why it's a thin little strip. Um, clearly the, the, the bias is very northern hemisphere related as well. Now we had a small survey program from Siding Springs three years ago and our government decided to cut over $100 million of funding to CSIRO and the 500 jobs, including the survey work that we've been doing for this list. Uh, so Australia has a giant blind spot, essentially, and the world's intrusion detection system has a blind spot that is over us. Um, this is potentially an opportunity for the amateur astronomy community, community, however, who no longer have to compete with these big, well-funded observatories in America. And it's potentially why someone like our own Terry Lovejoy uh, promptly found new comments and then got them named after him and not Siding Springs. <laughs> Uh, or, or one uh, person whose survey department lost funding was Robert McNaught, who discovered the incredible Comet McNaught. And this is a picture of Comet McNaught in 2007 that I took well before I, was, before I knew what I, I was doing. You could have just used your camera phone and it would have looked amazing. Uh, it was probably the most amazing uh, astronomical event I've ever seen in my entire life. It was stunning. Uh, now, if you're a really keen back out astronomer, you can get really deep into this instead of just finding or identifying asteroids, you can actually run light curve uh, data on this. And the light curve uh, stuff is a, it's a bit more work, you've got to take a lot of exposures and then analyse that. Um, but with this gear that I was talking about, like the RASAs, uh, the RASA that I'm using, the F2 RASA, uh, this is gear that's been used to, to find uh, asteroids and, and space junk and stuff like that, so you can, you can use this stuff. With uh, light curves, you can then go for, further, even though we can't see these asteroids, the little points of light in our photos, uh, you can actually study the light curve and use a process called uh, light curve inversion to turn them into 3D models of what they actually will look like. Um, and you can see examples of these 3D, 3D models here. You could process your light curves to look like that, and uh, when we eventually send the mission out and see what it looks like, they're pretty, they're pretty close. They do a pretty good job. Um, of course, light curve inversion doesn't work very well if the object is weird, like uh, when Rosetta got to uh, 61p, and the closer and closer they got, it just looked like a pair of testicles or a really small, <laughs> small penis. And you can see the presenters on the live stream just, just trying to present and trying to keep it serious, but uh, the closer and closer it got, it was just really hard to not giggle a little bit. Now, another thing that uh, astronomers can do is uh, when we're out imaging, um, and we're just recording, we're making these video files of the planets. Uh, this guy was just recording to take pretty pictures, as we say, and he noticed uh, a flash in his image, and it was a confirmed asteroid impact. Nothing that was on our radar, nothing that we had uh, at all detected. So, again, it's stuff that, that we don't know. Uh, this is a lunar impact flash. This is taken by a university, but any of us can take photos or take videos of the moon. And when a impact flash is um, when an impact flash is observed by a university, then the LRO can go and see where the impact crater is and actually see what happened. Another uh, astron astronomy science adventure is supernova hunting, and we're lucky to know a few boss uh, members of the boss supernova hunting group in the SAS Society. Uh, is there anyone from BOSS here today, the BOSS group? Well, I don't think they could make it today. Uh, but they're, they're a member of our society, and what these guys do is they have a library of galaxy images, and they link these images with new photos they take each night and look for anything that's changed. Sometimes they'll find a flash of a new star dying and throwing off its stellar material as it collapses. I was lucky to photograph one of their more famous discoveries, SN 2006-80J, which happened in Centaurus A. Uh, I wasn't using my telescope for this, I was using a um, remote observatory I had some credit on. Uh, now, if you, you know you've discovered something special when NASA's ears perk up and they decide to swing the Hubble Space Telescope around to have a look, uh, which is exactly what happened to these guys, and so that's Hubble's version, it's okay, I guess. <laughs> uh, but it's not all about telescopes. Uh, there is outreach, like we're doing here, and it the events and science is entertainment. Excuse me. I've had a cold for last week, so I'm just, I'm just getting through, but it's all right. Uh, there's processing the data, so Hubble data you can download uh, yourself, and you can process Hubble's data, you can even make discoveries. Uh, there's finding and collecting physical meteorites, which, which Jeff Nocken will talk to us. There's doing all uh, sky surveys with your um, 
any sort of camera equipment to, to uh, look for fireballs in the night sky. Uh, basically, whatever you're good at and whatever you enjoy. Um, so what's next for me? Uh, something that's been bugging me since I started mucking around with astronomy uh, was uh, why don't uh, we've got software, we've got lists, we've got telescopes, but why don't these things talk to each other properly? Um, if I have a phone number on a website, or if, if someone sends me a phone number, you can click on it with your phone. Your phone knows what to do with a phone number. It knows what to do with an address. You can click on an address and open it up. Uh, so that's something I'm thinking about. And you know what else really grinds my gears? <laughs> How come all the star signs get an emoji, but science gets a telescope, a microscope, and a round bottom yeah. test tube? Uh, we get a bunch of sun and moon stuff, mostly weather related, um, but there isn't like a single emoji for Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, <laughs> Neptune, or Pluto. Uh, the reason your phone can uh, understand these things and click on uh, a link or an address and know what to do with it or know what program to open it up is, is because there's a HTML specification. It's a 22 page document which says this is what you do with an address and then you can hand off that address to Google Maps or whatever you need to do. Uh, so I floated the idea of a celestial coordinates RFC with Bob Denny, the inventor of ASCOM standard, and he agrees that this is something that we could do to improve astronomy and potentially something the ASCOM group would support. I uh, spoke to Fraser Payne about it over the weekend as well. I feel like writing the RFC for celestial coordinates is something that could be a PhD project or at least a master's thesis. Uh, but I think I might just do it anyway, because I'm a web guy and I'm, I'm an IT guy, I'm an astronomer. And that's what I'm good at doing, so something like this contributes to the science. You could click on a link to a newly discovered object and have it loaded in whatever software you, where you want, your planetarium or directly by your telescope. You could be looking at something in the night sky and instead of writing down six numbers and six decimal places and trying to convert various coordinate types, you could just send it via iMessage to a remote observatory somewhere else. And they can open it in their software or they can open it in their telescope. Uh, but you couldn't send them an asteroid emoji though because there isn't one. Anyway, uh, Swinburne University gave me a HD this semester, so screw Morgan Freeman and screw my Year 9 maths teacher. Thank you very much everyone. <laughs> probably only about maybe over five years ago and that's all and he came along um, basically to meet us to see if we could help him take some pictures of the night sky <laughs> can you believe that <laughs> what he's done now I don't know when he sleeps I don't know how he turns his brain off at night but he's just meteoric really and you can see just with his talk today it's absolutely incredible what he's doing but what he's sharing and trying to share with you all is that a lot of you in this room are astronomers. And you are astronomers if you have a telescope. Even if you're taking pictures of the night sky with your camera and your tripod. Even if you're going out there with your binoculars and you're learning the constellations and you're learning your night sky. You are an observer of the night sky and you can call yourself an astronomer. Now there's a few things you can do with that. You can be happily in your garden and you can be sharing your telescope and enjoying it yourself and with your family and your friends. Or you might decide to do other things with that knowledge that you've got. <coughs> you might like to feel like educating the next generation, which is what I do. Um, or take beautiful photographs and let those photographs fly. Put them on your website, put them on your phones, and if anyone asks you for them and they take an interest in them, they say, can we use that photo in our school book or in a calendar? Or NASA contacts you and says, we love your photo, can we please use it? You go, yes, just use it, send it, let it fly free. 
Let your education fry free if you want to and you feel like it. Fifteen years ago, I was invited by NASA to be involved in the Cassini Huygens mission. And I've been involved with the astronomy and outreach for 15 years with NASA. And I'm their representative on the Gold Coast. And why did that happen? Because when I was a lot younger, I pestered them and pestered them and pestered them for material to go into schools like posters. And they thought, oh, we need someone from Australia. I wonder if this girl would be quite nice to do what we want to do. So when they asked me would I like to be involved with this mission, do you think I said yes? <laughs> I definitely said yes. So you never know what opportunities open for you. I know that you're all astronomers. You're all interested in the night sky. You can see what Dylan's doing. Um, all I say is that fair enough you can enjoy your own astronomy in your garden, but share it and find out if there's a bit of an outlet for that in you. And you never know where it's going to take you. And it is so thrilling, the universe. So now, I didn't know I was going to say all of that. <laughs> but um, I hope Dylan has inspired you. Um, and I'm going to open up for some questions and answers. Would anyone like to ask Dylan any questions about his presentation today, please? Oh. Show of hands. Uh, we've got a question on the back there. Does the microphone work? Yeah, just go. It's on. Is it Dylan? Yeah. Is it Dylan? Yeah. Uh, we'll see if this is this through. Yeah. Yeah. It's a Dylan wonderful presentation and congratulations uh, for this event as well as last year and indeed the incredible year that you've had. It's uh, humbling, it truly is. When you talked about all your efforts and discovery and all, all of your colleagues who are making these incredible efforts, how could the, the um, astronomical community worldwide, at least here in Australia, increase the recognition of those efforts? What do you think would help make even more people get involved? Uh, well, last year I floated the idea of, um, you know, if people aren't using their telescope to discover things in the night sky, you're going to get some serious recognition if they name a comet or name an asteroid after you, if you make a discovery like Terry Lovejoy. And one idea, one idea I had last year was that uh, you should uh, try and seek funding from a company like Coca-Cola or McDonald's or Google and get them to pay for an observatory. And if they discover a comet, it'll be called Comet Google and it will come around every 70 years or so. And it would be a ma uh, marketing tool to force. But uh, that, I don't really care who pays for uh, this program. I don't care who's paying for surveys and stuff like that. So I work closely with commercial people to, to make sure that the, the astronomy is funded as well. Uh, but there is a huge opportunity right now because of this blind spot with the near-Earth object detection to discover things and have your, have your name basically preserved in history. And the Australians who have done that have made huge splashes internationally. Um, Terry Lovejoy isn't here today to talk to us about that, but probably we want Terry Lovejoy, those sort of guys. They discover things that uh, are significant, significant for the entire astronomical community, and we will, we will receive recognition for that as Australians. Thanks, Alan. Any other questions? Question over here, we your microphone. Coming, microphone's coming. Here we go. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Dylan, that has been a brilliant presentation and all, for all of what you've done for us in such a short time, we thank you, we applaud you very much. I'm, I'm interested to know what you did to or for Corey Schmitz in South Africa to give you the name the Space Hooligan. <laughs> Uh, we, we rib each other a lot because uh, he's in South Africa, so I, I make fun of him just being in the ghetto and having lions lying around his, uh, his South African palace, and uh, he rips me about being an Aussie bogan, so uh, I'm, I'm the Aussie hooligan, and uh, he's a South African hooligan. Yeah, Corey Smith's a wonderful guy. He runs the Photographing Space website, and I would love him to be a speaker at one of these one year. He's a very accomplished astrophotographer, a good friend of mine, uh, Corey and Tanya, his wife, are both a uh, couple who do astrophotography for Get the Tigger. The mic. Oh, there we go. And um, yeah, I was just saying that they're, they're wonderful. I'm glad you follow them. If you don't follow them, um, photographingspace.com, there's a lot of stuff there. Uh, one more question, I think, and then we'll take it. Over, over yeah. here. Dylan, that's a 
fantastic presentation. I thank you so much. I, I'm in no, I, I'm not an expert in any of this stuff. I'm really just learning about it. But I wanted to ask you: Can you combine some of the things you were talking about? Because if you had the ability to uh, put a coordinate in, and you know, as you say, the address recognition for telescopes, is it an opportunity for citizen science that if you have a group of people in a room like this, if you've got lots of people who've got our home observatories, and you just assign parts of the sky, mm, then it would make a whole lot of us could could actually look for Leos <coughs> yep. in our own particular patch that's assigned. Yes, no, I agree completely. Having the, the HTML specification would just be a way for all the software to talk to each other. And because you can look at that list on the Minor Planet Center, but you can't actually click on the thing and then have that link do something. Like, just go to it, just just look at it. You have to manually work out what's what's available to you, then type the numbers into your hand controller. It, the, the hand controllers seem to me like very dumb things compared to our phones. Our phones are so sophisticated. So I think if we had the specification, especially if ASCOM supported it, then we could uh, make all the software interoperable. Whether you're using Sequence Generator Pro or Nebulosity or a hand controller or anything, everything would use the one standard. They could all talk to each other and we'd all get a lot more work done, particularly with batch, batch processing jobs near you and stuff like that. No, that's a fantastic application of that, yeah. And that, I think that's going to be it for now, because we're going to take a Just one break. break. We've got one more, one more, yeah. Um, this is a bit of a political question, but I thought you might have a, a view on it. Um, the changing in the operations of the Siding Springs at the AAO, and then the moving it um, into what it looks like it's going to be run by the universities. So do you have a view on whether that's uh, a good thing or a bad thing? I, I don't in particular because I'm not involved in, in any of that world. I think um, maybe John Sarkeesian would be a better per person to ask uh, when he's up on stage about that. But as a, as a person, I, I think I, I don't really care where the money comes from as long as the science gets done. Of course, if corporations pay, then uh, you can corporations tend to massage the data to make their own stuff look good. But this isn't about Coke funding sugar. It's about Coke funding a comet discovery. And, uh, and if they get to call it Comet Coke, well, good for them. As long as they surveyed the sky for so long with so much money and discovered a thousand near-Earth objects on the way, I think that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Well, thanks very much, guys.